Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We begin today by acknowledging that our college and the city of Winnipeg sit at the crossroads of the, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> Anishinaabe, Mete, Dakota, and OG Cree nations. As such, we acknowledge specifically that we are in Treaty 1 territory and on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I am pleased to acknowledge today the collaboration of St. Paul's College and the college's Jesuit Center for Catholic Studies with the Canadian Jesuit International Organization, led by Father Peter Niemeyer, uh, to bring you our lecture today. And now to the lecture and our speaker. So our speaker today is Father Jacques Nzumbu, Society of Jesus. And the title of his presentation is Green Technologies Exacerbate um, Exploitation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So I'm pleased to welcome Father Jacques uh, to be with us as he considers the harmful impact of green technology on human rights, conflict, and inequality in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, Father Jacques' expertise is in mining, renewable energy, and energy storage. He holds several master's degrees and is currently completing his doctorate at the Université de Québec à Montréal. So, please, may I ask you to join me in welcoming Father Jacques this afternoon. It is a pleasure for me to share with you some inputs about um, mining and uh, energy transition and conflict in the Congo. So we are talking about green justice. We're talking today first about climate change, global warming, and I will talk also about green technology needs to go from a red planet to the green planet. And also I will talk about how do we produce this kind of green or clean technologies. And the mining, the minerals, is very important in this process. And how we in Congo, we produce uh, strategic minerals for our phones, tablets, and this green transition. And finally, I'll be talking about what it is important for us to do together as we have uh, one world in solidarity with those who are suffering in the global south. So we are beginning with uh, the transition. As we know, all of us we want to give those who are coming after us not a red planet, but give them a chance to have a green planet for the future. But this challenge is our challenge today, not only for those that are coming tomorrow. But for the moment, because of the use, the use of uh, fossil energy, our planet, I can say, is now red. We need to move from the red planet to the green planet. The question is, how are we moving from the red planet, climate change and global warming, challenges to the green planet, sustainable planet, not today, 
also today, but tomorrow also. We are moving from uh, climate change challenges to the net zero emission. We need green technology. We need clean technologies. And here you can see we have a lot of green technologies for this transition. This is, a, I can say, a good news for all of us. It's a good news. We have to move. So we are supporting this transition. But this transition has some problems. We have to know about conflict. Because the question of green technologies is how do we produce the green technology for this kind of transition? So we need minerals. We need raw materials as cobalt, lithium, nickel, iron. They are very important for building the new economy, green economy, green technologies. Where strategic minerals comes, so we call uh, strategic minerals or critical minerals. Those are very important for green technology, for green economy. You see in the map of global critical mineral production. So. My country, I'm coming from Congo. I'm coming from Africa. I'm coming from Congo. Congo is located here in the Central Africa. So in Congo, we have most, you can say, 70% of the cobalt in the world, the world comes from Congo. And the cobalt is the key raw materials for batteries, for lithium ion batteries for electric car, for solar, uh, solar panel. So we need these Q material, raw materials. And also in Congo, we produce a lot of cobalt, lithium, coltan for our tablet, for our mobiles, our cell phones. And this is the map where strategic minerals comes. So now it is a race. We have a race. All the country in the world, we have in the we have a race of uh, I can say uh, strategic minerals. How to get those minerals for our economy, our green economy? But this race has huge consequences in my country. This is the history of the link between minerals and conflict in my country. And where, when minerals are important for uh, rebel groups, we say that this mineral now is becoming like uh, conflict minerals. So what is the position of uh, Congo, Congo's position and role in the production of critical raw materials. Congo is very important because of a number of critical minerals we have in Congo. You can see. So I'm talking about this region. The eastern of Congo. In Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, Tanzania, and Zambia, is of Congo, and southeastern. We have here more than 40, 40, 100, 40 100 rebels group, rebel groups, soldiers fighting there because of the, of the control of raw materials. So we have coltan here, 
we have uh, tungsten here, we have gold here, and in the southeast we have cobalt, copper, uranium, and also niobium. Very important for the transition. So, since uh, 1994, after the Rwanda genocide, in Congo, they have lost more than 10 million of Congolese have died because of the control also of raw materials. So Congo is very important in the super chain and value chains of uh, green technology. And how do we produce uh, strategic minerals in Congo for our global value chains of uh, batteries and electric car? We have two models. The first one is uh, uh, mining companies, multinational mining companies, including Canadian mining companies. They are in Congo. As we know, 80% uh, of uh, mining uh, companies' headquarters are located here in Canada. And in Congo, I can say also, 70% of uh, the exploration money, money comes from Canada in exchange, exchange talk of uh, Vancouver, uh, Toronto, or uh, uh, Montreal. So Canada is a huge player in mining supply chain and mining companies in Congo. And still now, we have a lot of mining companies coming from Canada in the south for cobalt and copper, and also in the north for the gold. So here you can see that this is open pit mine. So I am here visiting this open pit mine for cobalt and copper. And the air pollution is very, very high, high level in this mine. And here we are in the Cobalt in Lubumbashi, Lubumbashi in the southeast of Congo. But I can say that in this plant, the workers' conditions is not good. Now, produce this and the money impact on our life in Congo, our land, our waters, our Yes, air and forest. Those are the consequences of these uh, mining activities. Here you can see that the pollution of air is very high, and the land is polluted, water is polluted, and also they are destroying our forest in Congo. As we know also, after the Amazonia forest, Congo is the biggest pit for carbon capture in the world. Congo have 70% of the African forests. So when they are doing mining activities, at the same time, they are destroying the forest. So we are not solving the problem of climate change. You see, downstream, we have batteries, we have electric car, we have mobiles, we have uh, hydrogen, well, but as swim, how are we getting these raw materials? Destroying the same process, destroying forest. So we are not solving globally the problem of climate change because upstream there is a lot of problems. For this, we need a just transition, more ethics. We need also equity in this transition. We cannot destroy upstream infrastructure, upstream uh, forest by giving downstream, I can say something is very clean for the climate change. So we are not solving globally the problem of we are creating all, I can say, not only uh, 
conflict in the army level, but also we are creating social conflict when they are destroying our forest. Because local people have to change the way of living. That there is a huge conflict activities and uh, among the people there. Another uh, impact of uh, mining companies in Congo is a social, the well-being of the people. As I was saying uh, uh, before, the condition of uh, the condition of uh, workers are not very good in the mining companies. See, here I brought my car down because I was going to see leaders of uh, mining companies. There's no roads, but they are getting a lot of money coming from mining activities, but there is no road. I was going to see them. I brought my car down, so we are walking with my friend. You see, there's no road. So uh, I can say, in the social level, we don't have well-being. We don't take advantage of mining exploitation. So, and uh, mining companies don't create huge uh, jobs because it's a technique uh, process. So, um, because of the lack of uh, knowledge for the local people, they cannot get, uh, have jobs there inside mining companies. So, workers are coming outside of Congo, outside of these regions. So, for the people, this is very frustrating. For them. Now, a second model is artisanal mining activity. Here is a huge problem for us in Congo. If there is no direct link between mining companies and rebel groups and conflicts, but there is indirect links because those who are working in artisanal mining they sell the same product to mining companies so there is a link between all of them but there is a huge link between artisanal mining activities with rebel groups so when we are speaking about conflict minerals in Congo, in the world, mainly we are speaking about artisanal mining activities. Because here, we see that uh, rebel groups, they need money because we cannot go far supporting the war without money. It is impossible. So, uh, Rebellions and groups, rebel groups, they need money. And how to get money is to produce more and more cobalt, more and more gold, more and more tungsten, and to sell to uh, mining companies, and there they will get arms and money for this. The first consequence is uh, impact of uh, mining activities, uh, personal mining activities, is the safety of the vulnerable people. And the first are children and women. Women are washing. They are washing cobalt and copper in Lubumbashi, southeast of Congo. This water is very toxic, very polluted. So women are getting some diseases. It can give birth to children that's very, very, they have huge impact on health. So uh, not only, I can say, the safety for mothers, for children, for girls, but also I can say that the women here and the children are very, very destroyed because all the minerals of Congo in the south uh, east of Congo, like copper, like uh, uh, cobalt, have a little amount of uranium. Uranium. 
So they are working with Iran. This is the invisible, I can say, impact on the safety of a lot of women and children there in Congo. And also, we have a lot of, uh, I can say, human rights abuse and violation of women around the, the place where they are working. So they are very, very vulnerable. Right? So this is not a theory. So I am here in the ground because I was working in Lubumbashi, both with mining companies, with the government, and with artisanal miners. How can we do the things that are different? See, I went to see children working on the mining activities. So after they, they will have just one dollar, one dollar, and all product will be sold to sold to mining companies. So they are taking advantage of this. So the presence of a child in the mining supply chain mining in Congo is a huge problem for us in Congo. So how can we withdraw children and in the supply chains of cobalt and copper for our mobile, for our discount? It's a huge problem for us, you see. And the question is why children are working there? Because of the, the level of poverty, as the family are very poor. So they cannot go to the school. I can say in the southeast of Congo, here in Lubumbashi, uh, 400,000 children have no access to the education. So they have to work every day to support their own family. You know that children, the place for children is the school. It's the same, you see here. The family is working. Not only the father and the mother, but all members of the family are working how to have some money for the family. Even the little can have them, see what it is. So they are very strong. And I can say that uh, four days ago in the US, for the first time, they declare in the US that now lithium ion uh, products is now a child lover product. So for us, is a huge change in the world. For the first time in the US, they say that lithium iron products is now a child lover product. So here also in Canada, I mean, we are, we want to advocate of this kind of regulation so that we need, uh, we need cobalt. We need copper, we need lithium, nickel, but with more equity, with more respect on human rights. Yes, so that we can build together, win win, I can say transition to restoration. I don't know if you can, uh, uh, Peter, play this video. Just to see how the children are working. Yes. They don't go on the ground, but the role is washing the mineral. It's a small village in the southeast near Lubumbashi. It's the same video. So, all the water is polluted, very toxic. Women, women. 
So for us, it's a huge, a huge um, uh, challenge how to monitor. We do the monitoring of uh, water and air uh, pollution because uh, we do not have, I can say, knowledge and uh, I can say evidence uh, uh, to prove when we are going to the court and uh, when we are going to talk with mining companies. It's very, very, very uh, difficult for look at. Uh, yeah, it's the same. Women are washing also color. So here you can see um, how they are going on the ground to look for cobalt and copper. So the shifts can be they can be there on the ground more than uh, uh, ten hours or forty-four. Uh, uh, 50 hours on the ground to look for minerals, cobalt and copper. And without safety, they are going under the ground, 10 meters on the ground. Very difficult for them. So, here is the huge problem we have now in Congo is uh, the conflict, mineral conflict. You can see here, we have a soldier. So, those who are working there, artisanal miners. So after this work, all the product will be for the military, for the soldiers, not for the people, not for the people. So this guy will now go to sell to the mining, multinational mining companies. So all the money is not for those who are working, it's for those who are the own of this kind of uh, business. This is the real link between mining, uh, I can say, artisanal mining activities with rebels, well, rebel groups in East Africa. So, since 1994, there is no peace in Congo. No peace in Congo. So, more than 10 million people have died. So, uh, so I ask you are a priest, you are a Jesuit. Why are you involving in mining? I said no. More than ten million of people have died in my country. How to go far to look for solution of peace in my country? So I was sent to study mining governance, mining economy, mining policies in a way to give a change to my country for peace. for peace. Not only for business, but first for peace. Because without the control of this uh, issue in Congo, we'll never have peace in Congo. So we have to know the logic of economics behind this war in Congo, the geopolitics of minerals in Congo, and also have to know uh, the transition impact in Congo. And now we can begin the dialogue with business, with politics, inside the Congo and also outside the Congo. What is my point of view for peace in Congo? And the question is this. When saying this, we can be very distraught, saying, my God, my God, my have you abandoned me? When you are seeing 10 million people die, children without education, the violation of children, of women around this conflict. So we are not facing only the rebel groups, but we are also facing a social destruction conflict between people, between uh, ethnics, between uh, countries among us and also around the country. But we cannot end with this note of uh, yes, of stress.
but we have also signs of hope, uh, signs of hope, yes, in Congo, in the world. And the one is the advocacy and the network uh, for due diligence and uh, compliance. Compliance. This is very important. And what we are doing together with uh, CGI, our Jesuit, is to go more and more for more due diligence for mining companies here in Canada and also abroad and outside Canada. Not only uh, voluntary diligence, but mandatory, mandatory diligence and compliance for, uh, mo for more peace in the world. So for me, without uh, mandatory, mandatory compliance, without mandatory compliance and uh, diligence, this will be difficult for us to go for more peace in the super chains of uh, green technologies. So uh, now I can ask uh, Peter to come to tell us the link between Jesuits in Congo and here in Canada uh, about this due diligence process and compliance. So my name is Peter Niemeyer. I am the outreach coordinator for Canadian Jesuits International. Um, and we brought Father Jacques to on a speaking tour here to Winnipeg. We'll be going to Ottawa and then the Toronto area as well because we feel that this is a very important issue, a very timely issue in terms of green energy shift and transition and the environmental and human rights aspect to this push that is happening particularly in the global north with Canada legislating um, uh, by 2030 green vehicle sales only. Um, so this is going to put a lot of pressure on places like the Congo in terms of these resources and then the impact that the social impact uh, environmental impact that it's going to have or it will continue to have intensify uh, in the Congo. Um, I don't know if you saw but it said that there were about 400,000 children uh, who were involved um, and those children there are no schools built for them because they're working. So there's no reason to build schools because they're involved in the mining operations with washing cobalt. Uh, as Father Jacques also said, this is a particularly Canadian issue because up to 80% of the world's mining headquarters uh, or the world's mining companies are headquartered here in Canada. So this is a Canadian issue. And you have all received this handout uh, on the back of the handout, you will see ways that you can uh, engage in an advocacy campaign that we're asking uh, our audiences to engage in. And that is to call upon uh, the Canadian government um, to support two new bills that are before Parliament right at the moment. Bill C-262 and Bill C-263. Those are the two bills that we are encouraging Canadians to call upon their members of parliament to support. And you can go to the QR code, you can uh, go on there for an online petition that will go directly to, so once you put your address in there, it will go directly to your MP as well. The government has Bill S-211, it's passed the House of Commons, it's before the Senate right at the moment. It's the modern anti-slavery bill that has been introduced and most likely will be the bill that passes. We feel that this bill is insufficient to address the issue of enslaved labor that's involved in this and child labor that's involved in this because it only is calling upon companies to do a report about ways in which they're trying to prevent 
in slave labor or child labor uh, within their operations, but it's not calling them to actually act upon the findings that they uh, have within their report. So there's no obligation on behalf of the companies to actually do something concretely. This legislation that is before the Canadian Parliament is, it's, is very similar to the legislation that was introduced in Great Britain in 2015, also called the Modern um, Anti-Slavery Bill. And a study was done on this, and it determined that this bill, this legislation in the UK, did not alter or change corporate behavior on the ground. So it's evident that we have to have legislation that has teeth, and that holds Canadian companies accountable for how they do their business in the global south. So on the back of this page, you will find information. For so we felt that it's very important uh, to have you understand the Canadian connection to this and why it's important. And we want to encourage you uh, to sign on the online petition and even to write a letter. You can go to our website, you can get a template of a letter that you can use um, and send it off to your, to your member of parliament. So with that, we want to transition to uh, an opportunity for question and answers that you may have uh, with Father Jacques. So Father Jacques, if you want to come back here and if there are any questions that you might have, uh, we would be willing to take those at this point in time. Uh, thank you, Father. Yeah. I just want to learn more about the social corporate responsibility in Congo of those mining companies for whether they are Canadian or other indigenous companies. Not easy. Uh, in Congo now, we have uh, more than 200 more than 200 mining companies. All of them are international. No Congolese mining companies that are coming from, let say, America, North America, Canada, US, from Europe, and mainly from Asia from China. So China have 80% 80, uh, 80 of Congolese mineral market. So even if we are in North America, we are not buying cobalt from Congo, we are buying inputs coming from Congo via China because China have 80 percent of batteries supply chains in the world and China mining uh, minerals comes from Chile and from Congo so this is our issue so this question is very uh, complicated but all of them can say uh, there is little difference between Chinese mining companies and European mining companies. So the culture of extraction is the same. Was so your question more about the social corporate responsibility of right. companies coming investing? So, there so is, is there legislation in Congo? Yes. I know, I know, I know, okay. because. The legislation is, I can say that um, since 19, uh, 2018, we have a new mining legislation in Congo. And we worked hard, like the society, to make now all social corporate uh, uh, regulation like mandatory now. So all of this is in our mining code is mandatory for mining companies. But we have a problem. Mining companies, they don't want uh, 
uh, implementation of this new legislation. Because for them, now, as in Congo, we have uh, all things inside our mining code, social corporate responsibility is very huge, is demanding this narrative of mining companies for them. Because before it was voluntary, and now it's mandatory. But uh, for them, it's very complicated to do this mandatory. They want to change the legislation to go for a voluntary uh, legislation. But, uh, this is the first time we can have now a new mining code that gives to people the power to go to the court when the water, the air, is polluted in Congo. It's the first country in the world. But now, how can we implement this? Because of the link between the power, politics, and mining companies. So we don't have power, like civil society, to go to the court. This is the problem. The, I can say the legislation is very clear. But the implementation of this new legislation is very difficult because of the position of mining companies in Congo. They are very strong. The Jesuits in Congo were instrumental in getting the, the, the Congolese government to bring in legislation that would prevent child labor. So the legislation is there, but enforcement of the legislation is another matter. And that's why if we have pressure on the Canadian side of things or the European side of things uh, that would hold companies accountable for issues around child labor, then maybe that will change corporate behavior on the ground. Because the legislation in Congo is there, it's just the enforcement is not backing it up. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but there's another part of the, for the social corporate. For example, in, in our country for the oil companies, besides the, with the child labor and all other, they should invest in this community when it's so about roads, hospital, education, schools. It's also part of their social responsibility because they are taking resources from this community and they should contribute for the well-being and the welfare of the community. This is, I can say, this is the ideal uh, project. Uh, when you go to the website of these mining companies, you will see what they are saying. And in Congo, we are building roads, we are building hospitals, we are building schools. But I was working there, in, in the ground with them. Not only uh, <laughs> theoretical research. There is nothing for the people. But when you go to the website, you will see the report. But this report is for the outside reputation, not for the for the local people. They, well, they they know very well what to do, but they don't do anything. I can say anything to them. So for this, we went to the new mining legislation to put in like mandatory. They have to do. They have to do. If they don't do, we have go to, we have to go to the court. Because of the corruption also in the justice system, not easy to go with mining companies to the court. So it's a very difficult, complex issue. Uh, Jason, I think we'll take a question from online. Yeah, I'm going to invite uh, Eduardo da Costa to uh, ask his question. Eduardo, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Uh, so thank you so much for the presentation, Father Jaga. My name is Eduardo. I am a PhD candidate. Uh, in the uh, program here at the Mauro Center Institute. So my question is, uh, uh, my studies, I, I, I focus on very similar problems in the context of the Brazilian Amazon rainforest, where I come from. And it, it's amazing how, how similar the problems are, right? Uh, uh, as you were giving your presentation, I was just, uh, just, just uh, thinking about the reality in the Amazon. But my question is about, uh, 
specific information about the the demand side of of this problem, right? So, I was just wondering if you if you, in your studies you uh, you have been able to collect collect a more specific information about companies or a list of the companies that that buy and 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 market those minerals. You mentioned that China has about eighty percent of the demand, but I would be very interested if you have had the opportunity to to develop a list of companies. Uh, I mean, uh, or uh, countries or something, so that we could get a better understanding of the demand side of this problem, which is where we should uh, look uh, more carefully and try to maybe uh, apply more pressure uh, on on the demand side. So I'll be happy to stay in touch by email as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we can collaborate uh, in the future and this uh, kind of program because uh, I have, I mean, a few times to develop this uh, issue because now we are going to uh, the link between uh, global economy and uh, uh, mining in the Congo. Uh, it's not easy to, to do uh, the traceability of this kind of, uh, let's say, supply chain. For this, when I was in Germany, I was in Germany in 2018, uh, 19, I invited in the Bundestag, the German uh, parliament, to talk about uh, the due diligence, because Germany was planning to have a new legislation uh, about uh, uh, supply chains and global value chains. And uh, I met also the leaders of uh, Volkswagen, Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW, all of them. I talk with them. I know that they are sourcing cobalt, copper, tantal, coltan from Congo, but also uh, neighboring Congo. I asked. Do you know where the coltan you use in your batteries it comes from? So I got angry in Volkswagen and Mercedes. That's Jacques, we know, but uh, we cannot do the traceability of all our supply chains. It's impossible. Congo, you need to be strong. So the disorder in Congo is not a good thing. The war in Congo is not a good, a, a, a good thing for you. So we will need global leaders, but we cannot do the traceability of those. But I tell them, you know all of yours, of yours, Supply chains. You have to tell me. So it's not easy for them. Uh, it's just a, a thing I can say. Uh, all due diligence now, uh, non mandatory diligence, are asking companies downstream to have traceability of conflict mineral coming from. But they say that we cannot do this. It's costly for us. We'll do only for big, big suppliers, not for small suppliers. And that's the, the point. So they will buy not from the biggest one, they will buy from the little one. And they don't have responsibility to give the report to the German company. So in Congo, what is important for us is to know uh, the roads of our uh, minerals, mineral uh, exportation from uh, Zambia, from Zambia to South Africa or to Tanzania, and then Indian Ocean to Nguanzu, yes, to China. So we know uh, some mining companies who are sourcing from Congo. Uh, 
but also we know that most of them are coming from uh, Canada, coming from uh, US, coming from uh, uh, from Europe. But it's not easy to have uh, and to know the, you can say, the owner, owner of those mining companies. Not easy to know. It's, it's a huge, huge uncertainty. But they are the same. You can change all time mining companies, owners, but they are the same. But what we know now in Congo, we have huge mining companies, uh, huge multinational like Glencore. Glencore is, is from Switzerland. From Switzerland, Glencore is the first producer of cobalt in the world, with uh, forty percent coming from Congo. And I was in uh, uh, Sudbury last last month. I was in Sudbury. I went to visit Glencore. They have mining operation in, in Sudbury. So when I was talking with them, uh, they told me that it is impossible to, to understand that in Congo, things are not good like here. Because we, we, Glencore, we have a global culture of responsible, corporate responsible responsibility. You see, in, in Canada, it's different, and in Congo, the same company is working different and uh, not easy for them. So we have Globe, uh, we have Glencore is the first, uh, the, the first player. We have also, I can say, uh, Canadian mining companies. So I don't know, <laughs> like, uh, yes, Ivano, uh, Ivano, uh, uh, with Kamula, Kapula, Kamoa project. Ivano is now, I can say, the global second uh, mining operation in the world after Escondida in uh, uh, Chile uh, for copper. This is Canadian mining companies. But this company uh, is saying that we will proceed uh, with a lot of innovation in our operation. So we will be different to others. So we are waiting to see how these Canadian mining companies will be very different uh, from others, yes. Thank you, Father. I do have one other questioner online. Maybe there's time for one more question from Dr. Emma Alexander from the University of Winnipeg. Thank you very much for um, your excellent talk. Um, I'm interested in two aspects of um, human rights protection. One is children. Um, and I saw when I was in Congo um, for a long time in 2014-15, I saw the degree of human rights protection that children did not have. Um, but what concerns me most is the fact that Global Affairs Canada, in other words, <clears throat> the Canadian Embassy, which I became very familiar with, uh, the Canadian Embassy is there primarily to facilitate and to support mining companies. Most Canadians don't know that. <laughs> Most Canadians who come to, Ca to Congo don't know that. And my sense is that there are two prongs to this. One that is that we need to directly pressure global affairs to, first of all, be more transparent about its actual um, policy in Congo. Because, the, because global affairs ought to be supporting the DRC's mining code, right? And imp helping them implement this legislation, which they are not, they are doing the opposite by supporting companies. The second is that I think that consumers ought to be made more aware. I think for companies like Volkswagen or other companies that are selling to Canadian consumers, um, goods that goods made from products that are mined in Congo. I think the issue here is that Canadian consumers who are willing to buy green products, um, like expensive cars, should be aware of the human cost, should be made more aware. So I think those are those are two aspects that um, I would like to see 
more action on. And I thank you very much for all of the information you provided. Thank you so much for your input. Uh, I want to add something else. It is very good input. As you know, it's important for all of us as consumers. We have power to change things and to be aware that uh, we need uh, more and more just and I can say sustainable transition and equity in this transition. I'll just add one thing to that. I, I mean, part of this speaking tour is to raise awareness exactly on this point and then the advocacy piece. Um, so the Canadian government had introduced uh, an ombudsperson for corporate social responsibility and uh, they had said that that ombudsperson would have the power to compel evidence and uh, to hold uh, Canadian companies accountable for how they do their business in the global south. They publicly announced that on their website that that was their intention. Sherry Meyerhofer is the ombudsperson for that office, um, but when her office came into being, she did not have the powers to compel or to uh, hold Canadian companies to accountable for how they do their business in the, in the global south. So of the, the two bills that we're asking you to support, one of them, is to help beef up that office so that that office will have uh, the power to investigate and compel evidence when complaints come against Canadian uh, mining companies or other companies that operate in the global south. So thank you very much for that comment. Um, and thank you for hosting us. Yes, thank you all. Definitely our pleasure this afternoon to become more informed about with mining and Congo. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you all for coming, both of you, all of you who are here in the room today, as well as those of you who joined us through the webinar. Thank you very much. The next Grand Bag lecture will be November 4th, and Jason will be sending you updates on uh, the topic and timing and everything else. So thank you again, and thank you to our guests. <laughs>